Hello and welcome everybody. Um, today I'm interviewing Peter Rooney. Now I'm sure many of you know the work of Peter and you've got an image already in your head that you've seen of his. Um, but firstly, I just want to introduce Peter. Welcome firstly to the um, British Institute of Professional Photography. Thank you very much, Karen. Thank you for the invite. That's all right. How are you doing? Not too bad. Not too bad. End of another day. Yeah, uh, well, I'm going to say with the um, advanced technology that we have and we're all glued to at the minute, you're at the end of the day. We're really at the start of our day here and that's because you're over in Malaysia. That's correct, yes. So um, I want to start off, we're going to look at some of your amazing work today and I have to say that I've been a huge fan of your work for the last few years. I've seen uh, what you produce and your mind is just mind-blowing to me really what you come up with um but firstly i want to just ask a little bit about you um and being over in malaysia uh, so just tell us a little bit a bit about you first and tell us why why photography why photography and nothing else why this is a career um well it, it was a kind of um option rather than a choice which is funny enough i mean when i when i was growing up uh, my father was a an amateur photographer. Uh, we had a dark room at home. Um, so I used to spend a lot of time in the dark room with him. Um, in, it was a black and white then. Um, so I would get to see Dodge and Burning and, and compositing via the dark room and stuff. And I loved all that aspect of it, but um, I never really took much to the taking of the pictures. So what happened was, I think it was about the early eighties, um, would have been about 82, 83, I thought, you know, I can have a crack at this, you know, I'll, I'll go out. So I bought a Minolta, couldn't tell you the model too long ago, um, and I bought a macro lens, because everybody seems to have that little start in photographing the small stuff. Um, so then I, I bought a roll of 36, I remember it was ISO 400, but I had no idea what that meant, and I had no idea uh, what make it was. So I put it in the camera, no idea what I was doing at all, went home, went out into the garden, um, shot off the whole reel of 36 of spider webs, spiders, bees, flowers, grass, just, just anything I could do within 10 minutes. Went down to Boots the Chemist, um, had paid for it to be developed in within an hour. Um, spent that hour thinking that I had the front page of the National Geographic in the bag. Um, and when I got the photos back, I'm walking home and I'm, I'm flicking through the images. And it's just like those that didn't have the little sticker on them to say that they were out of focus um, were, yep, 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 yep. So by the time I got home, I just gave my camera to my dad and I said, yeah, you know, uh, do what you like with it. And that was it. I, for 30 years, I never picked up another camera. <coughs> um, excuse me. So um, when we decided to come over to... Uh, Asia, which 2010, I thought, well, I'll, I'll get an entry level DSLR um, and I will basically use that um, to document our journey. So, uh, you know, just, uh, just as a keepsake, but that we were in Brunei initially for three and a half years and for three years of those three and a half, it stayed in the camera bag. So um, for the last six months, I then took it out the camera bag and I tried everything. Um, lightning shots, water drop shots, um, landscapes, wildlife, and nothing, nothing really grabbed me at all um, until basically um, we left, we decided to leave Brunei and move to Malaysia. And at this point, I'd been in web development for 20 years um, and I was working for a, a telecoms company in London. And I was only supposed to go over for two years. To, to Asia, but after three and a half, we decided we didn't want to go back, we were going to try somewhere else. So um, that was the point of where we decided to part ways uh, with the company I was working at, and I thought, well, what, what can I do now? So um, I just sort of took the camera out of the bag, and I thought, well, this isn't ageist, because I think I was about 50 at the time. Um, this isn't ageist, I, I can't get a job um, with a company within Malaysia unless you're invited in so I had to find something that I could do as an alternate and so photography seemed the thing to do um, so as I do with most things I do um, I just decided that that was the point where there's more to it than just you know sticking in a roll of film and, and fit firing off the shots 
Um, so what I did was I just started to study lighting because I, I kind of got, I saw Sue Bryce and that's what made me think, well, I'll, I'll get into portraiture um, because that suddenly I, ha I felt I had a connection when I could see those, those sort of um, images that, that Sue Bryce at the fine art. And I thought that's kind of the direction I think I want to go in. So at that point, I realized that the important thing was lighting and, and to sort of step back and start to learn what was needed, um, posing, expression, lighting, get all of those things together first. Um, and that's kind of how I ended up getting into it. So. Oh, wow. So really, you're relatively new at this. Mm. I, I didn't... Um, I would probably say 2014 is when I picked up the camera properly um, and 2015, early 2015 was when I entered my first competition. Wow, that's incredible. And when, and when we look at your work um, in a short while, um, anyone watching this will see why that's incredible because of what we're going to see to be quite honest and i've got to say that um sue bryce has got a lot to answer for she's actually been the start of a lot of people's journeys in mm. photography and uh she is quite amazing and inspirational and and does put a lot of people on that on that right path within photography i think if you've been through her courses and watched her she's quite an inspiration isn't she yeah very much so yeah yeah so just tell me, Peter, going back um, to 1982, do you still have any of those? I used to love going in with my film. And like you said, you used to flick through them and have stickers on if they were out of focus. And you'd be like, oh, if you had one image that was anywhere near decent, you were lucky, I think. But have you got those images still? No, I don't. And there's actually an extremely sad story behind that. Um, because... Um, as I said, my father was an amateur photographer. He'd actually won some competitions back in the day. Um, and our house was just littered with images of my siblings and, and you know, in, in entire years and years and years of family. Um, and after my mother died, uh, you know, three or four years later, he married, remarried again. Um, and then he died not long after that. And long story short, she bagged up everything, including the photos and bin them oh my so goodness i have nothing which is another reason why i'm so passionate about giving people um you know the imagery because it, it resonates with me that i don't actually have anything so you know anything that i had initially stayed with my parents which is what you tend to do when you first move out and, and you start life mm -hmm. you keep everything there until you can take it back um, but before I got to the point where I could take it back, everything was binned. Oh, that is sad, isn't it? And I've, I've got to say that when I talk to my clients, and I'm sure a lot of people do the same, that um, I always say, when they're saying, oh, we don't know about an album, I think we'll just have it on a, you know, on a USB, or it's not USB anymore, it's even in the cloud, because all, all of that's uh, going. And I said, you should really cherish the print and being able to have that, because if I give the analogy of if you if you were in a house that was burning the first thing that you'd want to save is those memories you wouldn't care about anything else you'd want to retain those memories wouldn't you and uh that is really important so yeah i, I get that of wanting to kind of make sure that other people have got those memories that you you haven't visually got anymore it's yeah. just what's in your mind isn't it and um I do think what we do is an important job really and it's history we're documenting history yeah oh, well it's very much so yeah yeah i think that's yeah. you know that's uh, that's a very fair point and um you know it's, it's also having having the physical item to touch I, I look at i look at my images and i i have funny enough i have very little emotional connection to them um and it's mostly because i found that by having no emotional connection to them I can open myself up for critique without taking offense or, or without which has enabled me to grow and learn um, so when I see imagery that I do for people and then I see the reaction that I get and, and like you were saying with the prints I only deal with prints so if somebody comes to me their work is printed um, because I don't believe in digitals I, I don't yeah. have, I have no emotional connection to a digital that I do that I do have a print 
No, I think you're right there as well. And I see many images online. And when I've um, had the pleasure of going to um, events where they're holding competitions and, you know, award ceremonies, the one thing I love doing is, you know, you've seen the print online to actually, not the print, you've seen the image online, but when you actually see that print in front of you, it means so much more and you absorb yourself in it so much more. And I think you stand and look and appreciate it um, for everything that it is, rather than just being another image that you flick by online. Well, it is because, I mean, I've, I've found quite often that, you know, if I do have, I don't have many, most of them are in the unit behind me. Um, but, you know, when I, when I have an image hanging, if, if I see it online or on my computer, I, I, it, it, I, I get fed up of seeing it. But every day that I pass it, I, I still have, you know, I still enjoy it as a print, but I don't enjoy it as a digital. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, there, there is this, this definite thing that we're losing in, in people asking for digital so that's why i figured the easiest thing is to not give that as an option i give an i'll give a digital with the print but the, the digital is basically the same uh, same price as the print and do you know what people don't ever do anything with that digital they don't you know a print they will look at as you say you can walk past it every day they just they put a usb or the digital or whatever it however they've got it it's just not accessed is it so no. i think you're i think you're right there and we've got to protect the art form that we all produce to be honest now i am going to um just move on from this i'm going to say that um from what i see um you've kind of got two facets to your business so uh one of them is your um business that i would say and a, a lot of people would say is that you earn money from so your portrait side of things whether that's your portraiture your family work your studio work that you do and then the other side um of you and your business and what you've become synonymous with is your award-winning images and your creative mind so um just tell us why those two things are important to you as two separate entities of, of you and your business. I think they're important because they kind of cross over. Um, it's what you have in Malaysia is very different from like the UK. So um, I'm depending mostly on expats um, because uh, local traditions and Malaysians and, and um, and, and, and Chinese and, and then you've got language barriers and stuff and there's a lot of uh, Chinese or Malaysian photographers so they will go to their own so plus the style of what I do fine art isn't really their style so I was already a, a kind of um, a, a point where I, I had a very small marketplace to hit um, so the, the creative aspect of it was coming through trying to find a niche of, of of what would fit so what happens is now is is that i do get a lot of clients who want creative stuff um i mean the 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 one that i i, I you know the i did an image of of medusa um and i had to build a headpiece um with all the snakes and everything on it um and that was a client shoot that wasn't a creative shoot for me she saw my work and said i want to be medusa um, so I get people come to me for creative as well as, as um, not so much traditional because expats aren't traditional, um, which is why I've kind of taken a while to kind of find my, my market, so to speak. I suppose one feeds the other as well, doesn't it really? Yeah. Um, yeah, so your creative side helps you with your portraits and your portraits helps you with your creative side because you know what to do um, for your poses and, and everything else as we'll see in some of your images. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to share my screen and we're going to look at some of your work and you've um, kind of said you're going to talk through some of your images and your thought processes um, of going through them. And I think you're quite right in what you've said there and from what I see that I do see some of them as, I've, I've put them into three different folders. So we're gonna look at what I see as um, portrait work, but there's a lot of creativity in that. And you can tell us whether it's an image, whether um, you created for a client or whether it's something that you did for yourself, because there is that crossover and one leads to the other. And I think it's hard to tell 
in some of them to be quite honest so there, there's one that I've, I've put your images into a portrait folder and then I've put one into kind of what I would see a competition uh, folder as such and then the other is um, one that I love um, and I'm going to keep that to the end um, it really got my brain thinking about what you do to be fair so I'm going to share my screen and first of all we're going to come up with your um, more portrait side of things so how's that hopefully you can see my screen can, there uh, yes I can see do, do you I, I'd like to ask as well just before we go on to all these do you remember every single one of your portrait fittings and who yeah. they are do you remember their name yes this this is Adelina um, she was actually um, I think she was runner-up for um, Miss Malaysia Miss World Cup Miss World Malaysia um, and we've done a number of shoots over the years uh, and um, yeah we just kind of gelled in, and, and she's very good. She doesn't need a lot of direction. Um, this was actually for, when, when I came over to uh, Malaysia, I had no idea of, of, of what to do or where to go. So I sort of thought, well, maybe if I join an organization, um, then what I could do is if I join the organization, then I will get networking with other photographers and, and, and find, find a market that way. Um, so the first thing they wanted to do was a panel. Um, it was with the WPPI. Oh, no, sorry, not the W, um, MPPI, MPPA, sorry, um, which was, um, and so I had to, I had to do uh, a panel for, for qualification, and this was, this was one of the images um, that was in that panel. So this would have been from about 2015. Right. I but this, it, what, it, what it is, is a, a lot of the time, I don't use, always use a lot of models. A lot of the people that I use, um, our daughters of friends um, because I, I like I, I find models have a, have a certain way of working they'll have a natural way to pose um, which it becomes an instinct for them and it doesn't always fit what I want to do um, so Adelina's she's different she she can she can do that so but a lot of the the the, uh, the models that I use aren't actual models right. So even saying this is two, 2015, this is the beginning really of your career in photography yeah. and you're producing work like this already. Um, yeah. So there's only one way to go from here, isn't there really? If this is what you're producing right at the very beginning, we can, we're gonna see how you progress. Now, I love the eyes on this. Um, that is something you know that you focus on and everyone says it's always about the eyes. Um, well, we'll see if that's true or not with some of your images, actually, because your, your eye wanders around your, your images, um, as it should do in an image, but you do get fixated on the eyes here, and I love it. So tell us a bit more about this image. This was Simon. He was, he was traveling through, um, I think this would have been around 2016. He was traveling um, through Asia. He was from the UK, and he saw my work on Instagram, and um, he just... Uh, messaged me and just said you know uh, I'm in town you know can we do something so I said well yeah I'm free tomorrow um, so he just rocked up the next day so a lot of the things I was doing back then I, I hadn't planned they were just um, like with Adelina it's I had some tool in a box so I said just just wrap the tool around um, likewise here I had a black cloth that I was using for um, uh, for a backdrop but it, it just kind of struck me that he was he's obviously a striking looking guy um, so I just wanted to do something where I could just frame frame the face um, and just bring out his features um, so but yeah this this was a kind of message one afternoon met up the next day did the shoot and when you first started, Peter, did you uh, initially have, or did you play around with your lights much? Or did you have kind of a go-to um, kind of set that you would have? Um, I, I, when I knew that I was going to sort of take it seriously, because um, when, I, when I tend to commit to something, I, I go all in. Um, and I thought, well, okay, if I'm going to do this, I need to do it properly. So I started to research. I bought some Ellen Chromes, um, some large modifiers. Um, so I, I kind of knew 
um, I had the, 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 the gear to go with from the start because what I, the first thing I did, as I said, was I would just study lighting because I thought if, 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 you know, that's probably where my weak point was. That's why everything didn't stand out is because I didn't have the lighting right. Um, so when I was at this phase, I was, I was mostly, I think it, it's single light, um, with a large modifier close in to, to soften. Um, normally I would do a harsher light on a male, but it just, it just, it, I think it was a big uh, Optibox on this one. Yeah, and this works. So at what point in your career, like we're coming to some things a little bit different now, and um, what I find in your images, there's um, a lot of headpieces. Uh, you've talked about those with the Medusa image earlier, but you have headpieces, there's makeup, um, at what stage did you progress really on to being more creative? Um, it's, it's actually, I, I, I went the creative route almost immediately um, because when, when I came to, uh, when I came over and I had to do uh, my panel, I was speaking to the CCO, a uh, CEO of, of, of the uh, MPPA. Um, and I was putting client images through. And he said to me, oh, they're, you know, they're, they're very good commercial images and they have commercial value, you know, for a client, but you need something with more wow. And I'm just, I'm totally clueless. It's, you know, it's the first time I've ever done this. So I'm, I'm just kind of like, okay, what's wow? So I just started to think about it and I looked along at other images and it suddenly occurred to me that I think of it as um, like a fashion show. Now, what you'd have in a, in a fashion show is you have these designers and the outfits would come out and they're the most outrageous, ridiculous things that you've ever mm. seen. Nobody would ever wear them on the high street, except maybe Lady Gaga. Um, so it then got me to thinking that, but what it does is it allows the designer um, freedom to just push their abilities to the maximum you know so what what they're producing for the high street and for the high stores uh, of high st the stores um would be similar to you know um doing a, 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 a family shoot but then when you want to go creative you have to push beyond those barriers so i always think of it as a fashion show um so that's why i kind of started to take this creative route was just because i wanted to push the boundaries and i knew that if i entered competition um, that that would um, encourage me to um, to push this further and further. Without it, I didn't have the incentive. Yeah, and I suppose when you're entering competition, this is what gets you seen, isn't it? It's different. It is creative. It's a portrait. It's very well lit. Um, but the thing that kind of pushes it over to be seen by judges is that it's different in the fact you have got all the hair and makeup that goes with it. So did you... Did you find a team to work with? How did you go about this side of things? Because obviously it's, your background before this was technology. So where yeah. did you get this flair of knowing how you wanted an image like this to look? Well, it's, it's I mean, this, this was done by a makeup artist called uh, Ida. Um, she's very, very good, but she knew some designers. Um, so that, that's how we, that, that, that correlation came together on this particular show. Um, but I think I just went through Model Mayhem and, and tried to find makeup artists that wanted to collaborate. Um, and that's how I then started to find makeup artists. And then the more your work gets recognised, the more the makeup artists are, are key to work with you, so it, it becomes easier. Even though there's, there's a very small pocket here that, that have, in Malaysia, that have, you know, the, the kind of skill sets. Um, but I love that. So you're pushing boundaries from day one, really. Yes. Tell us, about, tell us a little bit about this one then. This is Izzy. Um, this is the daughter of a good friend of ours from Brunei and she came over um, and uh, a friend from Oman came over. So I, I set up a, a photo shoot. He was on. He was. He was going over to to Bali and passing through, and we'd known each other through competition for a couple of years. So I said, "We'll stop in, and and you know, we'll put together a shoot." And Izzy was with her mum, and I just said to her, "Look, you know, let's let's just do a shoot." 
so again i had i had like a, an old basque thing that was like um uh steampunk type and the draped around her as some of my wife's neck curtains um there's just some bits of dried floral that i found in various pots and a wig that we had um one of these cheap wigs but i just kind of ruffled it up um so we just went with the red theme was the idea because we we knew I, again this is one of ida's uh, makeups we wanted something very simple but something that draws straight to the eye uh, eyes of the subject um mm. so again it, it was just um you know we, we had this kind of theme of just decorating the eyes with the makeup um and then just complemented the reds and, and the beiges around with it yeah it's probably again, really it, works well doesn't it yeah she's she's uh she's very good i mean as i say she's she has no she's not a model or anything but um i'm very lucky and i have a lot of people who who will actually uh join me in some of my projects and as you say the more you do uh the more people want to work with you and get involved with your creations this um, is it. this this is bonnie this is my stepdaughter um this was uh, another daughter another friend's daughter did the makeup she was exceptionally good she's not in malaysia now which is a shame um, but we wanted to do like a kind of a fortune teller look. Um, and she makes costumes and stuff for the school because she was still at school at the time. So she makes these costumes and stuff for, um, for school plays. So we, we got this, this the haggard old thing that she had made for, for this stage show. Um, and we went with a kind of a green theme. Um, but I wanted to, I wanted like one eye shut with the scar and one eye open. But trying to get somebody to hold one eye shut and open the other one that ends up with a kind of really uncomfortable squint. Um, so this is actually a composite of two. What I did was I shot her with her eyes open and then I shot her with her eyes shut. And then I replaced ah. the shut eye with the second one so that the eyes are actually relaxed and they're not kind of fighting each other with one trying to shut and one trying to open. Ah, oh, interesting. And do you know what, once you, when you kind of say that, um, you kind of think oh well yeah of course because anyone watching this like i want to do now <laughs> i want to shut one eye and see <laughs> yeah. like, could i do that and actually you can't can you to get that no. relaxed eye i wanted, wanted yeah. it to look like a, a genuine injury so um and you know for that exact reason if, if, if you try it it's very difficult and then the eye that is open is kind of wide it's not natural um yeah. so i just got over that by just overlaying the closed eye over the open face and i love that and again the more you the more creation there is in your images i think the more you look around your images and see something new each time you look at it really yeah you know you kind of you've got the fingers going on there as well and the nails and uh, how long would would you say i mean this it's probably quite basic makeup in uh, respect to some of the images that we're going to, well, some of the images that we're going to see that have gone on to win awards. This is quite a basic makeup, um, surprisingly to those that are listening to this. So how much, how long would you take maybe um, in hair and makeup on something like this, do you think? Um, this one took mostly, because if you look on the open eye of the face, there's lots of eyes painted on mm -hmm. the side of the face. Um, and they're quite detailed, so they took quite a while. Um, the scar again is 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 her paintwork. Um, uh, so this this I, I would probably say this was about two or three hour. And are makeup. these images that maybe you put into competition or you do for yourself? Do you find that the makeup artists also enter them into competition for what they've done? Um, I haven't had that but what i have done is um i've i've like edited some images and stuff um for makeup artists who have helped me or work with me um right. but you know i just give them high resolution copies of everything we do and then i let them choose some images that they want for their portfolio um and then i edit them yeah now i love this this is Holly. This is Holly. This is another friend's daughter. Um, 
yeah this this one initially it, it again I, I had these these leaves but I, I didn't want a green thing I wanted a kind of a white thing so I knew what I was going to do is that I was going to whiten the skin um, not with paint but um, I was going to whiten the skin in post-production so I've got a piece of tool just wrapped around her waist um, with with a white basque on there um, and then I just wanted to keep the, the leaves uh, the slight saturation of green on there just just to break up um, the hands and then um, yeah, I just wanted to bring again, draw the face in with the red on the eyes and on and, and the uh, on the lips. So all the white on her skin is actually done post production. Yeah, yeah, that's done. Wow. I, I shoot fairly high key, um, and then um, I make the alterations uh, in Photoshop afterwards. Love it. Uh, and what I want you to say, if we're going through these. Um, and maybe I'll ask you at the end, actually, which is your favourite image of all the ones that you've shared? Because obviously you've sent these images to me. Um, so you've sent them all for a reason. And I'm just wondering which might be your favourite when we come to the end. Yes. So, um, <laughs> I bet it's a hard decision that actually. <laughs> They're also amazing and you love them all for different reasons. Yeah, I mean, as I say, each one tells a story or a part of my journey or what I was doing at that particular time. Um, and um, this is this is Ina, a, another friend's daughter. Um, and uh, it was the same girl, uh, Kai, who did the makeup for the uh, on my stepdaughter for the the, the witch um, who did this. Um, but what I did was I changed the features. I knew I knew ahead of time that I was going to elongate the neck. I was going to increase the, the, the size of the head um, and the eyes and the mouth. I just, so it's a kind of a caricature, um, but not that it would be completely obvious. Um, so, so this one, yeah. And that's on your on your. Um on your work that you can view, you do have caricature style portraits, don't you? Yes. Um, so, so do you have, do you, is there things that you want to achieve from that? Do people come to you with the idea, oh, I'd like to be this, and you kind of carry it out? Um, it's, it's, I, I kind of put it out there that it, it's, it was a way to try and get children interested in, in, in uh, having a photograph taken was, was so that, um, you know, if, if they were to dress as their favorite character um, from a Disney movie or from a fairy tale. Um, and the idea, I mean, such as this one here, this is Ina again, um, same girl as in, in the previous shot. Um, so the, the viewpoint when I, I produced a lot of these was that the, the desk represented um, uh, an employer's table, if you like, in an office. And each character was interviewing for their role within their story. Right. So there's, there's, there's over 20 of them in total. I was uh, going to say, I'm sure I've seen a panel of uh, a whole of these that you put together of this interview style thing. Yes, that's the panel. I put that panel together for the MPA. Um, yeah back in 2017 or something. Um, thought I was trying to be clever. I thought if I kept a common theme um, uh, across that that, that, would, um, that would be a, a beneficial thing. Um, but it came with its, its drawback. I got, I got my licentiateship through it. Um, but then what happened was is from that, then people saw it and then people said, oh, you know, my child would like to be this character or this character or this character. So it's, it's all a ways to a means. So it's always trying to find something that's different that, that, that you know, will, will appeal to people outside yeah. normal portraiture. I loved it actually. And I remember seeing this in, um, seeing the whole panel together. And from what I remember, Peter, one of the uh, comments um, was more about having a personality it wasn't the image itself they loved what they saw and the idea behind it all it was more of um 
the facial expressions to go along with the character. Is yeah. that feedback that you got at the time? Um, I don't remember the feedback I got back at the time. I, th I think a, a lot of it was that um, if I had incorporated a background of some description, um, then um, that, that would have gone uh, more my way, which is fair comment. Um, I just tried to keep everything uniform, and I think that's why um, that's that's why it didn't quite work as 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 I thought it might. And actually, when you when you say about this, this is still at the beginning of your journey of photography, and you're still producing work like this and coming out with your licentia. And I suppose anyone looking at it would say, "Wow, if that's what you were producing for licentia." why might that not have elevated but when you see a whole panel of it together and i do remember judges comments and i i remember something about had there been more facial expressions to go along with the character that they were playing that it could have possibly been elevated so i just remember and i thought oh wow this is really clever um and i love this uh, you know all your work's very different this this yeah this was um again this was with ida um we wanted to do like uh, it, it was a, a kind of a um, like a like a warrior like like a kind of warrior look. Um, so what happened was is is the face is uh, the, the body's actually green tones and I really loved that, um, but the face didn't kind of go according to plan and it came out to gold. Um, so that's why I went with black and white um, because then I could. Um, I could then kind of blend it better than, than the gold face and, and, and the green body. Um, but, you know, the textures and that on the skin with the paint is, is it worked really well. And I just got an old stick from outside and I wrapped it in stuff that I got from a floral shop. And then we got these weird plastic things that I got and I just formed a crown out of them. So a lot of the stuff that I do, and I mean, this, the, the, that's just a piece of Hessian material as a bra and a skirt. Um, that we painted a long time uh, along with as well um, but uh, yeah no that was um, that was an interesting shoot that one and it's amazing as well how different an image looks when you put it into black and white and I know uh, somebody is going to ask so I'm going to ask Peter, they're going to say, do you have, um, do you put your images through a black and white software or is this something that you've created yourself for your own look of black and white? Um, I use different techniques. I mean, I, I do have like Silver Effects Pro, um, but quite often I, I flick through them um, and there never seems to be anything that, that works. So um, then I, I just, you know, tend to, uh, manually turn it to black and white um, through various different techniques that I can't think of of hand. It was a while ago, um, but yeah, I mean, I, ha I have the software, but I don't, you know, like as I say, Silver Effects Pro, but I don't actually use it. Sometimes I might use it to get me to the starting point, mm. um, and sometimes it works, and then sometimes it doesn't. But I honestly can't remember whether I used it on this or not. I just know that somebody would ask that question. Oh, I love that depth of black and white. Is it, is it um, kind of something? Do you put it's, it? Through it's a lot. It's, yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot of kind of initially get it there, then dodge and burn, and then, and then curves, um, and then just dark and light, and then it's just tweaking. Yeah, going back to the dark room, you know, kind of playing around with your dodging and burning a lot of the time, and getting it to how you want it, and everyone's got their own look, haven't they? Yeah. So tell us a bit more about this. So this is a little bit different to what we've seen already. Yeah, this, this was, um, I wanted to try and uh, get into, it's a huge market in Asia of um, pre-wedding. I mean, they, they see pre-wedding photography as more important than actual wedding day. So that they'll go to a lot of expense to have a lot of uh, pre-wedding shots. So I wanted to try and have a shot of that. And this is Adelina again, as we saw in the, in the first shot. And this is her boyfriend, Jonathan. And um, we were, I was doing a, a shoot with them for something. I said, oh, well, let's just do, let's just try this. We'll get this white basque thing that I've got upstairs. Um, and then I'll just wrap some tool around you so it looks like a gown of a wedding dress. Um, and we just kind of put together this, this, this kind of wedding look. Um, 
but this one was was for the connection to get the connection between the two um, but yeah this was just a kind of a, a trial and error just playing around yeah i never went the wedding theme anyway because it I feel because there's so many out here that are um you know the johnson yeah. and such that have the yeah and just talking about johnson he's um he's a fellow of the institute as you are a fellow of the institute as well um an amazing photographer but he does specialize in that market and yeah. um he does it really, really well. I love his work. Listen, I, I, I mean, you look at, yeah, when you work, look at the work of like Johnson and, and, and Roger Tan as well, um, another bin, and there's a lot of photographers like that and, and their wedding work, I mean, I couldn't compete with that. It's just, yeah. you know. And Kedder's another one, isn't he? Kedder, Kedder is he, yeah. He's yeah. another one. Um, so, you know, that market over here is for those guys. It's. Uh, it's, it's, and for uh, you, actually, to compete with that market, they're like local celebrities, aren't they? Well, national oh, celebrities. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 you know, Peter, I love the creative work that you do. And I think you've found where you sit, to be fair. So, again, this is different to uh, the other ones. And you're trying something different here. And how long ago would this image have been? This, this was just over a year ago. This, um, this is a friend of ours who's, who wanted to do a maternity shoot. Um, so again, I, I just didn't want to go. The, 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 there was a story behind this image because what was going to happen was, is um, she was going to uh, sit here and have the and She knew it was a boy, which is why we had the blue blanket. That was his blanket and that was his teddy. Um, so the idea was that we would shoot this and then after she had the baby, we would do a newborn shoot, which I was just I, I was really dreading, um, but up for anything. So, um, and the idea was we would then recreate this again, but with the baby on the blanket. So she would have a set of two on the wall, one like this and one with the baby. Um, on the day, because as you know, I mean, it, it's, I've only really done a couple of newborns, but... Um, you only have like 10 days or whatever it is. And it's just so scary. Um, and um, so by the time, you know, she had not long had uh, her son and then she came around and we did the shoot. We did a newborn shoot. Um, but by the end of it, she, everyone was kind of tired. And we never got to do the, the second image to this one. Um, and he's, he's over a year now. So he's just had his <laughs> And whatever it is so uh, so yeah I don't think it works much now but it's one of those things that that was like part one of a two-part idea um, but it, it never materialized and it's nice actually to see that somebody like yourself and I, I would imagine a lot of your work is you have an idea in your mind how can you make it come into to fruition and is it actually going to work after all of that and it's quite nice to see I suppose in a way that you had an idea and actually it didn't materialize at the end but you still went with it to see what you could could do and i've got to say <laughs> i'm with you on the babies i tried them <laughs> and oh, yeah. it's it's like doing weddings where that's your niche you know how to do it you're an expert in that field and babies is a minefield and mm. it takes a lot of training to know how to handle these babies yeah. Um, and it's not something that can happen overnight as any newborn, uh, a great reputable newborn photographer will tell you. And the health and safety behind it all is just tremendous. Um, so you might have had a look at escape on that one. I, I thought, yeah, I thought I'd have a quick look, but um, I, I yeah. didn't put my toe too deep in that water. Um, oh, what's the name now? This was the, um, I did a, a shoot initially Oh, I can't remember a name. I did a shoot initially. This would have been around 2016 or 17. Um, and she was my first caricature. She was um, Little Red Riding Hood. But oh. uh, I, I, um, I did a couple, but yeah, she's, she's like holding a little bird with a little basket. Um, but she just had this really iconic face for kind of scream to me, final, fine art portraits. Um, so, um, 
I, yeah, I just, I just said to a lot, I've got, I've got this dress upstairs because, you know, I'd, I'd love to be able to have access to some of the UK charity shops because this sort of dress and that that she's wearing here, you can't get in Malaysia. It's, it's not an easy thing to access. Um, but I think this was her dress and she came in and I, so I just said, yeah, I need to shoot that. And then I wrapped a bit of tool around and, uh, and, and put something in the hair and, and uh, just a simplistic shot, really. Um, yeah, and I suppose this is the kind of shot that if we're, we're talking about fine art portraiture, this is, this is probably a shot that everyone would have in their mind, isn't it? This is typically a yeah. fine art portraiture shot. But this is it. This is why I was just trying things with textures and grain and, um, you know, lighting. And, and it, it was kind of an experimental image that was off the back of, of, of the, uh, the main image, which was the, the Red Riding Hood image. Yeah, and I love that image. I'm just going to, uh, the red, this is beautiful, but I do, I, I know the red riding one and I think it's a, a great image. I'm just stopping my screen there because I'm going to go on to four images that you've shared that you're going to talk through. Now, I would say you are a wizard in Photoshop. Now, I don't know how long you spend creating some of these images. Maybe you can enlighten us to how long that you would typically maybe spend. I know all images are going to be different and yeah. that would depend on um, how many composites you're doing. And I know some of your images entail uh, many composites and many days and hours of creating the image before you even get to the composite stage. So maybe you can just share with us a little bit more uh, detail into these four images that we're going to look at that some of you will definitely have seen one of them because it's in the magazine, in the, in the last magazine. Um, and we'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. But um, some of them you would have seen in competitions maybe anyway. So you could tell us, if you went to them into competition, how did they do? And maybe um, how long you're looking at creating an image that, that we're looking at. So let me share my screen on this one. Right, so here we go. I'm just going to hide that for a minute. So the more I've looked at this image, the more I've actually seen what it's actually about. And uh, I think in today's uh, social society, it's, uh, it's an image that really we should be showing all teenagers, I think. So tell us a little bit more about it, Peter. Well, this is, is quite a, well, it's a, it's a bit of a long story, this one. But um, where we live, we live, it's a bit like Centre Parks. We're in, we're in a, a community, in a gated community, but it's a bit like Centre Parks. So it's all jungle walks and stuff like that. And as you go around, Part, uh, around part one of a uh, part of the the uh, the area, there's always these skips and stuff um, that people throw their rubbish into. And um, I'm going past one day, and I just saw this grey leg sticking out. So I thought, oh, what's that? So then I kind of saw this sack, and I thought, oh, it's a mannequin. And me being me, thought, yeah, I can do something with that. I don't know what, but I can do something with it. So I went back, I tried to lift it out and I couldn't get this thing out. So I went back, um, my wife came out, we got the car, lifted this huge sack out. And it turned out there was a, a male, female and a boy and a girl. So two little children, all mannequins in, in this little sack. So I brought them back and I put them in the carport um, where they sat. And every day I'd go out and I'd have a walk and I think, well, what can I do with um, this mannequin? You know, there's the, you know, what can I do that hasn't been done? Um, and one day I came back in and I was just looking at Facebook and I saw that my other stepdaughter, not Bonnie, but the, the other stepdaughter, that she posted another profile picture. And I thought, that's not your nose. That's not your eyes. Your jaw's not that narrow. And I'm like, you know, so I said, are you changing your features? No, 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 no. It's, it's just makeup. I'm, no, you're changing your features. Is there a, I didn't realize at the time that there is a facial changing app. Um, so, and she was changing her features. So as I was going out the next day, I kind of thought, well, that's what the mannequin, I could use the mannequin for. So what I did was I used Cara, um, friend's daughter. And I said, well, what we're going to do is, is we'll have you as yourself and you will be putting the makeup on a mannequin. Um, the makeup that you're putting on the mannequin 
is what you represent yourself with on social media for likes and you know to, for popularity but it's not the real you so what the image actually represents is is the head um the head of of, of what she wants to look like but the people don't see what's below the neck they just which is an empty shell because it's it's an alter ego um, and then what we have is in the process of, of trying to become something she isn't, she's losing her own features. So she's losing her own identity in trying to become an identity of somebody that she isn't. And that's why I called this the lost identity. Um, so that, that was kind of where the concept, and now, although my daughter hates me telling that, but that's where the concept of, of this idea came up from. I think it's fascinating and again as I said earlier it's one of those images that um, the more you look at it the more you see in it and you you actually see what it's all about uh, I think it's very clever so how long did it take you to produce this um, this wasn't too bad because all the any composite I do I do my own elements I shoot my own elements so I shoot everything under the same lighting. So I know the same lighting condition is, 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 is for all the elements. So putting it together is usually easy. I don't have to try and fit one element in with another element. Um, so this probably would, um, to, to put it together probably would have been, a, a, would have done it in a day. But then I start to go through it the day after I leave it, I go back, I tweak it, I change it. You know, so that's what really takes the time is the fine tuning. Um, but this one, I actually won first place in Super Eyes Portrait Masters competition oh, wow. um, under creative. And I remember after that, Richard Wood, who was one of the main judges, um, I put it in for critique because he did like a critique. Um, and he said it scored 88. And um, he, when he was critiquing it, he said, the one thing that kept it from a 90 um, and from reaching, you know, from reaching gold was because you put the title in the banner. So if you see the, the top of the newspaper that I created in, on, the, on the TV screen, um, yeah. I'm, I'm telling the story. And he said that I lost points because of that, because, of, you know, the judge will want to interpret the story themselves. They don't want it, especially in text format. They don't want to be told what the story is. You can do it visually, but not textually. Um, so that was, a, again, what I did was I took from that. And then when I entered it into competitions after that, I just put that in as a black banner. So this is an old version of that because um, I just have a black banner to took that out. So it's, it's all these parts of things that help you learn. Yeah. Uh, well, that's interesting, isn't it? That something like that would actually just knock it down a couple of marks. But I think it's... <laughs> I know that um, a few images that I've entered myself before into competitions, there might have been something on a t-shirt where they've said, we love that portrait, it's beautiful, it would have scored much higher. Had you just removed any kind of motifs on the t-shirt or, you know, you just shot it in a plain t-shirt in the first place. So, yeah, and that's something that, as you say, you wouldn't have thought about, would you, before entering it, no, but you I, do I thought, learn. Yeah, you kind of think you're being clever in, in, in you know, sort of, well, I'll guide the, I'll guide the viewer to what the story is about, just in case they don't get it. Um, and then it kind of backfires on you because it, it, it's kind of, they don't want to see that, they want to interpret it themselves. Yeah, I was going to say, you're just telling the whole story. Yeah. Um, so tell us more about this one. I'm kind of this... in two minds on this. I'm thinking, uh, it's, it's great that children have got their own imagination and they're coming to life. Um. Yeah, I, I think this this one actually came from the book. I was I was in a bookstore and I, I saw the book that she's holding, and I suddenly thought, oh, I'll build a story around that. Um, let me build a, a a kind of a horror story. Um, so this is this is part of my home because my studio is in my home. Um, so what I've done is the wall at the background I've actually painted grey so that I can drop textures of wallpaper and stuff over it. So I shot the wallpaper separately and then I overlaid that. Um, so initially what I'd done is I'd built this elaborate splintered wood parquet flooring 
um, that she was going to be coming out of. So it looked like it was, she was breaking through the floor, but it didn't work out. Um, so then I substituted the idea for smoke. Um, but the, the girl who did the makeup is the daughter of a friend. Um, and she's only 12. Oh, wow. So she does this pretty impressive, um, and if you see my Medusa shop, she did the makeup for that as well. Um, so I try and encourage talent like that as well by incorporating her in my shoots um, so that she can learn to, to push her boundaries, um, which she wouldn't normally get the opportunity to do. And then, you know, when she gets uh, the images and stuff like this that she can use as a portfolio. So it's all about helping these guys to, to build up. Yeah. Uh, and didn't you use uh, the uh, the lady in this shot here? Did you do a portrait of that individually as well that I've seen? No, I haven't done a portrait of just this. No, again, no. It's, it's, it's a, it, this again is a is a composite in in that these are sisters, um, and Ruby, the younger sister, she's the one reading the book. So I shot her initially. Um, and then Lamani I shot um, and coming through the wooden thing that I built initially but it was so dark you couldn't make out what it was and I had I was gonna have like a blue light coming out and, and this kind of thing um, and then what I did was I, I um, held up some wallpaper on saying tore it and then she poked her head through so I shot those and then added the elements in um, and the eyes I just turned to white because it just they just looks a little bit better white. But, yeah, so. no, it's it's great. And do they have this on the wall at home? Um, this one they don't, no. Yeah, interesting. So this this next image is the one that you will have all seen in the um recent magazine. And anybody re-watching this video, this is we are 2020, and this would have been the Christmas edition. Uh yeah, uh, with 2021 now, it would have been the Christmas edition of the magazine uh, 2020 stroke 21. Now, this image is the image, um, if I'm correct, Peter, that has been entered. You are part of the team, um, the World Photographic Cup Challenge UK team for the British Institute of Professional Photography. I am, yes, very honoured to be as well. Yeah. So congratulations on that, firstly. Um, I know Richard Bradbury, the team captain, doesn't, um, he, he, he looks at the photographers that he chooses and the creative mind and uh, what they can offer. And obviously he gets people that can do lots of different genres. And uh, congratulations because it's no mean feat getting into the, getting into the team. Much. No, but, no. It's, uh... So tell us about this image then and what it means actually, uh, you've just said it's uh, a privilege to be in the team, but tell us what it means to be able to represent, um, I know you're in Malaysia, but you're obviously representing the UK um, within the team and the Institute. So tell us firstly about the image and um, what it means to be in the team. Um, the image itself um, was, was probably my breakthrough image. Um, to, to my genre here, if you like, or the niche that I was looking for. Now, what happened was, is that Kim's, of this, um, the, the, the two girls, Lamani and, and Ruby, are from the previous shot in the Scary Stories. These are the sisters. Um, now, these, uh, these guys are not um, your typical, I would like a family portrait type people. But my wife um, gave Kim a, 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 a voucher for a shoot with me for her birthday. So we went around for, for quite a while and she was going, I'm, I'm just not, you know, I, I'll never get Sean a husband. I'll never get Sean to, to do a family shoot. I'm not the sort who could just sit there and put my hand up and, and sit on a sofa and, and, you know, arms around the kids. It's just not me. Um, so she said, well, I'll, I'll do something separately. I'll do it with colours or, or something because she's an art teacher. So then I said, well, look, I said, if we, if we want to do a family shot, how about we do a satirical one? I said, so that way we get all the family in and all Sean has to do is sit in a chair and look fed up. 
um, you know, so, um, so again, what I did was, is I initially, I shot, I said, well, what we'll do is, is we'll have Sean coming home from work. Um, he's kind of tired, disheveled, whatever. Um, just looking at his phone, ignoring what's going on around him. Uh, his son is just pinching his bottle of beer and he swapped it for a bottle of chili sauce. Um, and you're doing an ironing. And this is the irony of it, is that Kim never irons. It's, it's one <laughs> that she never does. So I said, well, let's put you behind an ironing board. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll have, um, you know, a chair with all the clean washing on it. Um, and then we'll have Lamani coming in moaning that Ruby's stolen her makeup and she's been using it for putting on paint. And then um, Ruby's now cleaning her face of all the paint on your clean washing. So it was just like, how about we do something like that? So um, she said, yeah, absolutely, let's do that. So what I did was I initially shot um, Sean um, and, and his son, and then I shot Kim. And the trick was being that Kim's getting Kim's eyesight, because she's a separate shot, so that her eye line would be where it should be, which is hitting the bottle of chili sauce. Um, and then I shot the girl separately. And then I brought the three together um and you know when I, I they got a big canvas of this on their wall um and when i when i presented this to them she just said that is my family she said that is my life you have just nailed it um so it went from taking a, a solution to a problem of of how do we get um and now what's happened is i've just got people coming forward i want that with my family i've already done another four Oh. Um, I've got another two or three lined up and then a friend over the road, she, she's, um, she came over and she just said that, um, oh, I want one for my office. I want it as a corporate shot instead of all the, just the individual portraits. I want it with my management team. And I've got one guy who's always counting his money and I've got another guy, two guys who are the best of mates, but they're always fighting. So, um, what we're going to do is, is she's going to have a, a, like a day party at her house and then they'll come over one by one. And then I'll do this big corporate image of each of the characters in a management team. Um, so that could then escalate. And then as she was showing them these images to say, this is what we're doing. They were then saying, Oh, I need to do this with my family. So it's suddenly that niche has, has kind of opened up that I was looking for. So I think this is kind of my way forward. Oh, I love that. And uh, what a brilliant story to create something that uh, you wanted to do yourself. And I would say that every um, family currently will identify with this in lockdown, that their yeah. whole life's mad and nothing, nothing is, is, is as it should be, but everyone's still being themselves. Um, and I can see, I can definitely see why this is going to be working with families and uh, and as you say, corporates as well to have that image of you know everyone has their own role, don't they? And how do they sit within the company? Just, just and yeah, yeah, I love it. And uh, well, that's brilliant that you've been able to create something there that has gone on to be what could be your your niche, really. Well, this is it. It was just it was just a case of finding a solution to somebody who who didn't want the traditional. And it's like, well, how can we incorporate a family without being traditional? So I said, well, let's just go the other way. Let's just go satirical. Um, and this was the result. And, you know, people see this and it's like, well, I haven't seen this before over here. Um, so, well, uh, I love it. And I, I say good luck in, uh, in the competition with it. Let's see how it goes. We'll, we'll be watching this space. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to finish on the last creative one that we've got. Um, tell us about this. This is a recent image, I think, is it, Peter? Yes, this was, this was at the start of lockdown. This is actually also in the creative of the World Photography Cup. So I've got two images in there. Oh, this I didn't realise that, actually. Um, and, uh, yeah, this, these are good friends of ours, Dan and Tabitha. Um, and this, this was... I've been watching like a TV show called Siren and I, I sort of, um, um, I just sort of had this, well, I wanted to do a mermaid type thing, but everybody's done a mermaid. So I wanted to kind of a different take on it. Um, and 
initially what I did was because it was in lockdown and they they'd gone over to they he's a pilot for China in, uh, for an airline in China and they'd gone to Thailand but they'd been locked out of China at the start of the pandemic um, so we said well you know come and stay with us you know live with us until you can you can move on um, so they came to us so it's just a perfect opportunity for me to to think of something to do so I said well I want to do this kind of siren type look um, but I'd, I'd got a, um, a fish tank and I put water in it and I put green food coloring in it and I was always going to use that as the water and then I was going to get a fish um, but I couldn't get to a store to get a fish and then I looked up on my above my PC and I, I have a you can see it behind me I have a skeleton just um, stood up there and it was it was just a beige skeleton and I suddenly thought well actually instead of a fish tail what if I use um, like a, a, a skeleton that the, the bottom end of a skeleton instead of a fish so then I found these little fish um, online so I bought one of those because I just suddenly thought that everything below the water is going to be dead but as she comes to the surface so she reforms into a human form so that's what's kind of happening here is is just below the surface her body's starting to reform because she's closer to the surface of the water um, and then as she drops under, so she goes to her natural form. Um, she's got her unfortunate victim, last victim in, still in the back of her hand. Um, and she's luring in um, Dan for the, uh, for the same fate, I guess. Um, so yeah, so what I did was I had Dan on a box um, and I went outside around here and we have these big, huge boulders. So I photographed a boulder and then um, I then photographed grass verge outside um, and then I overlaid the two of those. So I just built up all the image from, from various bits of grounds and stuff around here. Um, but all the elements are, are shot here. And the water I got by running was from a different image because um, her hand was right here. But what we were doing is I got my wife to pour water, bottle of water down her arm as I took the shot so I could capture the water dripping and then I added a few of the waters together to give it more density. Um, wow so there's, there's so many elements to that image so many and you've thought them thought every single one of them out so how long so how long was the thought process and how long did it take you to um obviously composite this to to where you you've got it today and you're happy with it the 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 thought process is probably one of the longest parts um, because I, I, I have to think of a story. It's, it's like, well, what is the story that I'm telling? I, I, you know, I can't just have, um, I can't just have, you know, th this random thing there. There has to be a story element to it. Um, so first I then, I then sort of walk around and, and then I just start telling myself a story and I'll make up a story. Um, and then once I've got that, and then I just think, well, what do I need as elements? So then um, I decide that, you know, below the water is, is going to be dead. So I need skeletal things rather than normal fish because then it, it wouldn't make sense. Um, and then, so, so yeah, so it, that was probably the longest process was to think of that. Um, then the shoot itself is, is, is fairly straightforward again, because, um, you know, I, 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 I tend to know my lights now. So, you know, I just know that I need to get the lighting right. Um, and what we've got here is, is where, where Tabitha is, is my wife's got, um, a, a blanket or a sheet around her waist so that she can get the angle of leaning forward without falling over. Um, so there's lots of little bits in there that you can't see from here. Um, and then, you know, putting it together is, again, it doesn't take long to put it together initially when all the components, when you get all the components in, because everything I shoot, I shoot on gray, um, so that it's easy to cut out. Um, gray doesn't give me any, any kind of um, uh, color pollution like a green screen or something. So I don't have to worry about, um, you know, edges of the skin being green, this kind of thing. Um, and then, yeah, and then I get, so I get all the elements in together and then once they're, uh, once they're all done, um, it's the tweaking. Mm. I then go back and 
I don't like that. So I need to change it for this. And then I go back and that can take weeks. Yeah. Um, and when, when do you, you know, know when to so stop, that, that Peter? Um, usually because the deadline to the competition has come up. <laughs> it's usually, that's, that's, that's the thing that kind of stopped me. Um, because then that, that's my, that's my, you know, my stop. But I like, I like to be at a point, um, like stuff I'm working on for my first entries into FET this year. Um, so I like to be where I am now with those entries, um, so that I've got two weeks just to go away, come back, tweak it. Um, and then I, I cause my wife is, is she's, she's pretty, gig clued up on, on all of this now because I mean she's assisted me so many times and she's very very good um, and you know she'll walk in and I'll just say what well, what do you think of that because you know what it's like you, I mean especially if you're on a composite you, it's only so long before you reach saturation point and then you're kind of like you, you hit a wall and you can't see anymore so that's when I usually say you know to my wife you know can you come in and have a look and then she'll say well that doesn't make sense or oh, that doesn't work, that doesn't make sense. So then I then have to go back. But I work in a kind of a non district Everything I do is in within Photoshop, I do is separate folders. So if I need to take something out or put it in, um, it's it's a fairly simple process. But yeah, it, it could take you know a couple of weeks. Brilliant. Can I ask, uh, Peter, does your mind ever stop? Do you? No. No, no, it's, um, I think that's the problem, as I say, I mean, I, I, I think about it even when I'm asleep, because then I wake up and I've got, oh yeah, I need to, I know what I need to do now, I need to fix that, or I need to add that, or I need to change that, um, so I think even in my sleep, in my subconscious, I'm, I'm still going over, um, and then before I've done that, I'm always thinking about what my next project's going to be, um, yeah. And then, you know, something else, I'll see something else and I'll think, because it's just things that I see visually that give me ideas. And then I'll see something, I'll go, oh, yeah, I'm going to do that. Um, so then I'm thinking about that before I finish the last project. And so it just goes from one into the other. So it, it never stops. Well, we're going to finally look at um, an image that I absolutely love. And I know that you've um, done the second part of this image recently. Um, so we're going to finish on this set. Um, you've done very well from this image, from what I can gather. Uh, but again, it's a composite and it's, um, let me get it up here. And just, so tell us about this. There's two images that I'm just going to flick between here. Um, I love the detail in this skirt personally. Um, I just adore everything about that, the tones and everything on it. But what I'm going to show is this has gone to a final image of, of this. Now tell us about this image and about doing these images separately because after this um, I'm going to finish this interview with a video um, of a part of how a how this image came about so you'll be able to see more about it but but tell us why this image and how this came about and and how well you've done with this image well um this image initially this this came out because i wanted to do a ballet dance i wanted to shoot a ballet dancer I, I just thought you know the 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 way they hold themselves it's, it's just something you know really magical about dancers that you you can't get wrong i think just just by the nature of who they are um, and so I wanted to uh, do, but it's very difficult to find one. And I was in the restaurant with a, a friend and neighbor and, and one of her friends was there and it came up in discussion. And she said, oh, my daughter's a ballet dancer, but she's over in Australia. And she said, oh, but she's coming over. So I said, well, I said, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd love to do this shoot. And so then I got into the thought process of what do I do with it? I knew that I wanted individual images but I also thought, well, how can I make it into a story um, so that I could combine multiple images together? Um, so I came up with the idea that she was um, a, actually like a, um, a toy 
or, or a figurine. Um, so that just seemed the natural thing to do. So um, I figured where that I'd have a toy maker. So I got friend and neighbor, John, he just looked to me like the toy maker. Um, and basically I thought, well, I'll shoot all the individual images knowing that I was going to be shoot, shooting this in the end. So that was the tricky part was to get the lighting so that it, it flowed between individual images and, and a final composite, um, where she would be much reduced. So, um, what happened was is that um, these, as you rightly said, these were from the uh, we, we, we different outfits um, that I was going to put on these like toilet roll boxes that we've got all night toilet roll boxes. So I thought well, that that will fit well for um, for a stand. Um, so we just went through a series of different poses, um, and I thought I didn't want them all standing because I thought that you know I needed this kind of triangle. Um, so what I thought was I'd have two standing and one in the middle where she sat. And, and then we've got this, this, this kind of triangular uh, section there. I had more props initially on the table, but I thought that, that it was too busy. Um, I knew I wanted a shelf on the wall because the, the idea was that the, the story behind it is that the toy maker had lost his wife a number of years ago, but in her youth, she was a ballet dancer. Um, and he was a, a toy maker of traditional toys. So his kind of start is what you're seeing on the wall, even though I dropped the opacity so it, it doesn't drop, drop right into your eye. Um, so he, that, but that's where his humble beginnings came from. And in a dedication to his wife, he now dedicates all his time into making these, um, these figurines uh, in, in her memory. So I wanted to do one image where he was kind of partially making one. So we had like, you know, that you knew that he made them and that they weren't, otherwise it's just kind of, what are they? Um, so I got a pose that I thought would, would, would fit well with that. Put the, uh, got Georgie to do the pose and then I put the model into the same pose um, and then put her over and, and then just did it so it looked like he's half painted her. Um, and yeah, I mean, as it is, it turned out, it did exceptionally well. Um, you know, as I say, the MPA got me international photographer of the year. Um, it won fine art portrait and portraits, a, a number of, of, of awards, um, that it won. So it, ha it has been, um, a very good image to me over the last year. But you see, the thing is that, when Georgie came over, um, it took 10 hours is where that, that video that you've got. Um, mm. I decided that I'd bring a friend in to do a video because it's just, again, it's just something that would look good on a behind the scenes. Um, and we shot for 10 hours that day. But what I wasn't aware of is, is that Georgie hadn't done ballet for two years. She's uh, uh, um, like a tap dancing now. Um, so she practiced for two weeks solidly before she came over so she could get back on point. Um, and then when she arrived, she had like a flu bug. She had a cold, but I never knew. And for 10 hours, she just went time after time after time. So, you know, as I say to people at the end of the day, it's not, this, this isn't my image. You know, I'm just the guy who pushes the buttons and puts it together. But without the likes of Georgie and, and you know, her dedication and, and, you know, the image wouldn't be there. So a lot of these images that come from the dedication and support of other people. Um, I'm, I'm just the, the instrument. I think you're slightly more than that, Peter. <laughs> but I'm sure that she loves that image. Has she got that on her wall? Because I, if that was of me and, uh, I was a dancer and done that year to have that. I mean, it's just a beautiful piece of art to, to always have, isn't it? It's timeless. Yeah. Yeah. It is, it is, um, as I say, it's, it's one of those that resonates, I think with a lot of people. Yeah. So I'm going to finish, um, this interview with that video at the very end, but before I do, um, there's two things. Uh, firstly, I mean, I've had a little sneak peek into what you're up to 
and it's very <laughs> exciting and it's going to be great when you share what you're what you're up to next but tell us apart from that what is next for peter rooney where do you go from here how do you how do you keep elevating yourself um well the next thing is um malaysia has some um very affluent people and i've discovered recently that one of my neighbors um owns 20 supercars um and he's 35 i think and there's another one who owns 10 and another one who owns three um and also learned that malaysia has the highest concentration of supercars in the world so um i put on my tim wallace hat and i said to the guy i said that you know these these cars must be like uh children to you you know and so i said how about would you have a fine art print of, of a car um of, of one of your cars you know all of your cars so alex said yeah i'll have all three and then bernard who's the guy who's got 20 he said yeah you know there's a good market for that and then we know the marketing team at ferrari and so again it's that's probably something that's new to me um but that's something that i shall dip my toe into i think in in the coming months so um it will be a little bit different from what i normally do um so yeah the, the, i'm quite excited and, and looking about what i'm capable of doing there you know it's, it's more about just going out and seeing if, if you can do anything a little bit different or or you know if you can actually make something like that you know part of your resume so that's kind of what i've got um from a, 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 a like a bit of a work perspective um but the creative side is is th there'll be something else tomorrow you know I, I i need to i need to just get through um the few that i have as you said i mean the toy maker two is done now um and the other ones that you're you're mentioning uh are coming to to fruition now so and they so, are amazing very thought-provoking Yes, yes, it's, it's something that was kind of close to my heart, um, you know, for 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 a number of years, and it's a project that I've had in my mind since last year. Um, so I'll be interested to see how it's how it's received. Yeah. Well, <laughs> good luck with that. Good luck, and it will all will be revealed soon. Um, so yeah, good luck what you're doing in the future with the cars. Thank the you, um, you know. And they're amazing. I've sat in one of the cars when I had the pleasure of going over to um, Shanghai. I see their supercars and what they do, and I just they're mad on them. And oh. if you can get into that niche, then that's a whole new world, isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a different world, um, and it's what I'm actually quite interested in. So it would be different from what I'm used to doing. So another string to the bow, um, more of a commercial environment. So. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I'll look forward to that. Great. Well, I'm going to finish this video um, with your video, but all this leaves me to say is thank you so much, Peter Rooney, fellow of the British Institute of Professional Photography. It's been an absolute pleasure to see inside your wonderful creative mind. And um, make sure you keep chatting to our members. And I'm sure there's going to be questions under the video when it goes out. So thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Absolute pleasure. It's, um, we'll, we'll speak again soon. Yes, look forward to it.